Getabook.today presents the Praetorian Imperative. Book 6 in the Starship Expeditionary Fleet Series by Shane Lachlan Black. Copyright 2019. Chapter 4. The Viceroy of the Military Affairs Committee was a scrivener of a man by the name of Watson Pete. Powers had considered and rejected at least six different ways to ask subcommittee chairperson Pete why his first name was a last name. But he ultimately decided against provoking another sneer. The man's teeth needed cleaning, and not just a standard pass in a dentist's office, but heavy-duty particle beam fire at close range. Pete had long been in the habit of allowing his number two to do all the confronting while he waited for opportunities to deliver the rhetorical coup de grace. The ranking member representing the opposition caucus occasionally went a few rounds with the chairperson. Each of those tangles inevitably concluded with Pete invoking some obscure point of order that prevented further discussion. He celebrated each victory with a prolonged grimace, and then stepped aside so Deputy Chairperson Coda Hull could begin wheezing another series of confusing and frequently pointless questions. Her unique contribution was her steel-gray hair, which was done up in a haphazard beehive that listed at least nine degrees to starboard and contained enough hairspray to blow a bank safe if it were equipped with a fuse. Now then, Mr. Powers, I'd like to return to the events of three weeks ago if you don't mind. It's Admiral Powers, ma'am. Hull looked over her glasses. The glare from the lights could have sterilized a prostitute's pillowcase. I beg your pardon? My rank and title are both admiral, ma'am. Just like your title, Madam Subcommittee Co-Chairperson. Hull looked back at the rotund, volleyball-shaped little man from the General Counsel's office. He nodded. She made a point of leaning forward in her seat, as if offering a wordless, so what, in protest. Very well, Admiral Powers. Can you explain why the spacecraft DSS, a pause to straighten glasses, Argent, Argent, Gent. Another look at Mr. Volleyball. Argent was ordered into the Atlantis sector. Powers leaned forward. His amplified voice filled the room. No, ma'am. I cannot. Who issued that order? I am in command of Southern Banner. And you can't tell us why this order was issued? No, ma'am. I cannot. Why can't you explain your orders, Admiral? The objective of Argent's mission remains classified. Captain Hunter was sent to the designated coordinates to help secure the safety of the Proximan base in the Rho Theta system and the inhabitants of Mycenae Sedai. I'm afraid I can't go into any further details at this time. Captain Crowell marveled at the Admiral's detailed non-answers to the question of who ordered Argent into the Atlantis sector. Every officer knew the entire region was off-limits. Affirmatively taking responsibility for the order would be tantamount to confessing to a criminal act. But Powers was the master. The man had been a hearing witness for almost 16 minutes and hadn't offered the subcommittee a single piece of definitive information. Perhaps we should be asking someone else? There is nobody else, ma'am. I'm afraid you're stuck with me. Perhaps someone who outranks you? Nobody outranks me. Pete couldn't resist. I think President Baines might have something to say about that, Admiral. I'm sure he would, Mr. Committee Chairperson. But as the Marines often remind us, if you want someone to park jeeps, you get a PFC or a Lance Corporal, not a three-star general. President Baines has more important things to do than monitor the whereabouts of one battleship. That's why he hired me. Pete pushed ahead. Hunter and his ship were formerly under the command of Eastern Banner, were they not? That is correct. You are in charge of Southern Banner. Shouldn't we be asking a different officer these questions? Hunter's ship was transferred to Southern Banner some time ago, along with all the remaining ships and crews in Task Force Perseus. 
I don't understand. Doesn't that require authorization? Hull interjected. Yes, it does, ma'am. I authorized it. I'm afraid I'm not following you. Like most bureaucrats, Kota Hull could not grasp the concept of the chain of command. In her world, unless a political consensus involving nine different departments was reached, refilling a pitcher of iced tea required the signatures of people in three different buildings. As a flag officer, I have the authority to assume command of any starship in the fleet. I simply transferred those ships to my command and sent seven vessels to Eastern Banner for purposes of balance. To be fair, our yeoman did all the work. We just signed the papers. So all this takes is a signature? That is correct, ma'am. I sign probably 200 documents a day. My yeoman will be happy to explain that part of my job to you. She's far more knowledgeable. The two politicians looked aghast. The idea of an enlisted fleet yeoman reassigning starships was beyond their comprehension. Your yeoman? She's the highest ranking E2 in the fleet, ma'am. Why is that, Admiral? Because she speaks with my voice. And nobody outranks you. Correct. Finally, the ranking opposition member leaned forward. I believe the Admiral's time is valuable, Madam Subcommittee Co-Chairperson. We have a number of important questions, ranking member, Pete replied. Surely we can find a topic more relevant than hide the paperwork. A few chuckles swirled through the audience. Pete wrapped his official little block of wood on the table to restore his notion of order. Was Argent ordered into the Atlantis sector, Admiral? I'm afraid I can't answer that question, ma'am. The details of Argent's mission are classified. Then perhaps we need to declassify the details of that mission. That's above both our pay grades. Pete took over. How did Admiral Hafnitz end up in the hospital? The starship St. Lucia and elements of her strike fleet were attacked without provocation by enemy starships near the Omicron 474 supermassive singularity. St. Lucia returned to base with casualties. The starship Taysan was lost with all hands in the engagement. Several other vessels were disabled but recovered. Enemy starships, Admiral? Yes, sir. What makes you think they are our enemy? Because they opened fire on our forces without provocation and killed 486 men and women. Why would they do that, Admiral? Power's jaw tightened. Because they are the enemy, Mr. Subcommittee Chairperson. Did our ships or crews do anything to provoke the attack? No, they didn't. And you know this because... Because they are trained to avoid provoking armed conflicts unless it is absolutely necessary. Admiral Neela Hafnitz is one of the finest flag officers Skywatch has ever had the privilege to commission. How? Our ship captains are trained not to fire on anyone unless fired upon. That principle is at the top of our rules of engagement. This is a consistent rule, Admiral. It hasn't changed in more than 110 years, Mr. Subcommittee Chairperson. Will there be an official inquiry into the events surrounding the Omicron engagement? Both Captain Hunter and Admiral Hafnitz were debriefed when they arrived at Allegheny Station. The Admiral's debriefing had to be cut short, as she was scheduled for emergency surgery. Pete flipped pages, hastily scanning the notes prepared for him by his staff. And Captain Delgado? Was he debriefed? Negative. Why is that, Admiral? Because he's dead. The magnitude of the committee's lack of preparation hadn't come into focus until now. Admiral Powers was well aware politicians and meeting attenders were unlikely to ever take the prevention of war seriously. They simply had different priorities. None of them had ever faced serious danger, and they certainly had never faced the business end of an enemy plasma rifle. They were far more interested in scoring cheap political points while wasting the time of high-ranking officials. The problem was this particular situation was long on danger and short on political opportunity. After President Baines's self-inflicted administrative disability, the cooperation of the Corps Council was at a premium. All the dire warnings in the world weren't going to overcome the inertia of the likes of chairpersons Pete and Hull. No self-respecting military officer could bring him or herself to take them seriously. The two names together made them sound like a fishing supply company. Powers knew he was likely to find himself acting in defense of the Corps Alliance without official authorization, which was only going to exacerbate his future. Thou shalt answer to the subcommittee problems. He needed to get back to Skywatch Command. Only Heaven knew what clouds were gathering on the horizon by now. The parochial appearance of the homestead reminded Jason of his family albums and the stories of his distant ancestors from a place called Texas. He was often struck by the similarities he found among human domiciles. 
It was as if the ideal image of a house and farm were somehow imprinted on people's minds long before they could even pronounce the word house. The boys ran ahead once they reached the edge of the fence around the front yard. Everything had a worn appearance, like the handle of a hammer that had been passed down through a couple of generations. The fence in particular looked as if it should have been sagging in places, but despite the fact its last coat of paint was at least three years past its expiration date, the structure was rock solid. Whoever built it was serious about their expression of craft. The mom appeared on the porch as the three boys stampeded up the steps and roared into the house with their aircraft and radio. All three started shouting for their grandfather at the same time. Jason was suddenly self-conscious, as he wasn't dressed to be invited to breakfast. He was wearing a pair of new jeans, white athletic shoes, and a Skywatch Marine Corps camouflage green t-shirt complete with a skull and crossed rifles for decoration. He thought he must have looked like he just capped off a 19-hour binge. His only saving grace was he had remembered to shave, so at least he didn't look like he had just been sprung from the local drunk tank after the 19-hour binge. I'm Pamela Hansen, the woman said, stepping down to the path and extending her hand. Her smile and personality were distinctly down home, as was her courtesy. Jason Hunter, pleasure to meet you. I hope the boys didn't cause you any trouble. Heaven only knows what they get into out there by the pond every morning. It's quite all right. I seem to remember getting into a little trouble by the pond myself when I was that age. We're just sitting down to breakfast. Won't you join us? I'd be honored. The parlor in the home was exactly how Jason would have imagined it if he had the time before stepping through the front door. The furniture was antique. The walls were covered with framed pictures, and there was even an old-fashioned oil lamp on the keystand under an oval-shaped mirror. The wooden floors were polished to a luxurious shine, and no matter where you were, you could catch the warm scent of toasted bread with a hint of fruit and flowers from the kitchen. The Epsilon Gamma sun was now above the trees, which filled the house with a golden-white glow. Jason was sure if he didn't have a war to fight, he would find a place just like this one to call his own. He briefly imagined himself strolling out into the field early in the morning to tend the tomato plants. How wonderful it would be to have no worries, and just contemplate the quiet horizon and the blue sky. Cool soil and cold water would be enough to feed a family. All a man would need then would be someone to share it all. Jason couldn't help but think of Cerulea. He knew full well she wouldn't last two nights on a homestead farm in the Epsilon Gamma system, of all places. He also knew she would have a blade to his neck in record time if he suggested she wear an apron. But he still couldn't stop himself from thinking about her, and what it would be like to build a life together. Jason felt as if a great weight had been lifted. Had it really been so long? Had he really been so concerned with life as a fleet officer that he never had the time to think about the man instead of the rank? Would things really be all that different if his biggest concern was painting the barn? Hunter had been in charge almost all of his adult life. While it was true he had learned to take orders during his time at the academy, less than a year elapsed between the day he could legally sign his name and the day he assumed command of his first squad. He was a man when he could obligate himself and take the responsibility for keeping his word. He was a leader of men when he took the responsibility to command a squad as a cadet. That was a lot of responsibility for a teenager, as some of his older relatives often pointed out. The hunter swagger shoved most of the concerns aside, but reality was different. Circumstances placed the young officer in a position of towering responsibility long before his time. The temptation to walk away from it all was palpable, especially when the chips were down and the argent faithful were up against it. Moo's quip about the five-pound officer wearing a hundred pounds of brass wasn't too far off. Rack Hansen, the man offering to shake Jason's hand, had a gentle look about the eyes but hands like bear claws. Welcome to our home. The boys tell me you managed to get that infernal contraption they got hold of in the air for a change. I'll tell you I must have fiddled with that thing for hours. He patted Jason's shoulder. Come sit at table with us. We could stand some news from someone other than the old Ginny at the Traders for a change. The dining room wasn't all that different from the parlor or the living room. The table easily accommodated twelve, and probably had a configuration that could extend it for more. There was a centerpiece, matching china and cups. Then there was bowl after dish after plate of food piled inches deep. Eggs, bacon, biscuits, fruit, almonds, cornbread, and hash browns. 
There were even sliced potatoes cooked to a golden brown and a pitcher of orange juice that reminded the captain how long it had been since he had even tasted an orange. What was already on the table was easily enough to feed a dozen grown men. Jason credibly wondered if he would be able to get back into his uniform if he partook of all that was being offered. The boys raced back into the dining room at what by now Hunter had concluded was the default cruising velocity for a ten-year-old male. They sat in their chairs, which is to say they sort of stopped moving near them long enough to make it appear they were seated. Six half-sized hands started reaching for ladles and serving spatulas, which drew a short attention-getting bark from Grandpa and a well-rehearsed announcement from Mom to commence hand-washing. She didn't even turn to look. She was busy creating another heaping plate of something delightful. An older girl who Jason guessed was perhaps within a year of fifteen wandered into the room. She was dressed in a breezy yellow top and a pair of light-colored dungarees. She had put some effort into brushing her shoulder-length sandy hair, but her expression made it look like she had just stirred from about thirteen hours of sleep. She sat heavily and rested her head in one hand. The entirety of her responsibilities for the day had apparently just been fulfilled. Jason looked around the room again. It was museum-like. A tribute to the history of the Hansen family of Epsilon Gamma III. There was an enormous china cabinet with plates dating from at least 100 years back. Every flat surface, including all the walls, was covered with square, rectangular, and oval-shaped picture frames, most made of hammered metal or polished wood. There must have been two dozen different people in the pictures. One or two depicted a much younger Rack Hansen posing in fields with what looked like automated irrigation equipment. The homestead had been the Hansons for at least two or three generations, Jason mused. He knew the patriarch was involved in either the sale or maintenance and repair of colony irrigation equipment. But Jason could also tell there was a wound in this family. One that had been suffered recently and had yet to heal. It was one of those things the captain had been trained to do over the years. He had learned to read people by their faces and the way they moved. It was a useful skill for a soldier. Using it against his enemies had won Hunter more than his fair share of battles. The boys were ten years old and wouldn't understand the situation, even if it were explained to them. But for a man whose job it was to lead several thousand trained soldiers and fleet crew in combat, recognizing unspoken problems was necessary. Pamela looked as if she were trying to avoid setting off a landmine in the dining room. The way she walked gave it away. She was trying to be weightless and avoid making noise, as if the slightest floorboard creak would cause the dam to burst. She was also being unusually careful with the dishes. There was no tablecloth to protect, so it was fairly obvious there was something going on besides concern over a blob of jam falling off an unbalanced piece of toast. Yet despite the look of overcast skies in the family's demeanor, there was a perceptible strength in the room as well. Despite whatever had happened, here they were, all together near the heart of their home, sharing time and a meal together. Jason thought back to his days as a child and teenager. His parents insisted on dinner with an almost religious consistency. It was that foundation and rock that made it possible for him to take chances and bounce back from failures. He and Jace had spent their entire childhoods competing in sports and extracurricular activities. If he and his sister hadn't had the kind of solid family foundation they grew up with, heaven only knew where they would have wandered off to after a setback. Jason was well aware of his penchant for veering off in new and unexpected directions. He also knew how good he was at recruiting allies. Were it not for his parents and their steady support over the years, he was fairly certain he would have ended up in charge of a small time criminal organization. As it turned out, he only spent his spare time flirting with the head of a small-time criminal organization. Life here looked so simple. Hunter compared what he was seeing to the logistics of feeding several thousand fleet crew, officers and marines aboard ship. Breakfast had to be broken into ten shifts in order to accommodate just his ship's enlisted crew and marines. It all came together with predictable fleet precision on ten mess decks over the course of 150 minutes every morning. For the officers, it took 90 minutes in the three officers' mess decks. Six people and a guest were far easier. Here, the most elaborate preparations were filling plates and dishes in the kitchen and making sure the yard apes washed their hands. Jason wondered how someone could make the transition from one to the other. He had to admit he was beginning to appreciate the troubles veteran fleet and marines experienced in post-service civilian life. Going from being in command of a half-mile-long warship to pass the hash browns, would put a strain on anyone. 
even someone well-adjusted enough to recognize the difference between fighting for one's country and living in it. Rack was nominated to say grace. He spoke of his neighbors and prayed for their protection in the times to come. Jason's antenna activated. He knew there had been rumors of trouble in the outlying systems. He wondered if perhaps those rumors included the Epsilon systems and the Reach. Hunter made a mental note. He would have to be careful for obvious reasons, but at the same time if there were a problem on EG3, it would need to be solved if for no other reason than to protect his grandfather. General Cornelius Hunter was a formidable man, to be sure, but his marine service had left him just off enough to make him unpredictable under stress, not to mention the fact the man was in his late sixties. Jason and his sister could handle him. Most of the rest of the world would probably have a little trouble, even with reinforcements. Several minutes of passing the eggs, salt, bread and jam followed. The boys ate about the way most adults would expect. They wolfed down the potatoes and toast, stirred the eggs in circles, and drank orange juice with both hands. Dawn, the older girl, ate like she was trying to avoid nutrition. Jason had to hand it to Grandpa, however. He kept at her until she finished almost half what she was served. Pamela smiled and ate delicately. Grandpa Hansen glanced at Hunter more than once. He had something to say. He was taking his time getting around to it. Boys tell me you got yourself some pretty advanced tools for a farmer. Oh, Jason replied, reaching down and unhooking the universal case from his belt. I carry this out of habit now. Turns out I almost never get through a day without using it at least once. May I? Rack asked. Hunter noticed Dawn staring. It had probably been some time since the teenager had seen anyone Jason's age. Hunter recognized the look and went about his business so as not to encourage what was likely to become inevitable infatuation. He concentrated on his sliced potatoes. Rack opened the case and examined the universal tool. Like all Skywatch-issued devices, it was made of nearly indestructible lattice duseline, built around a reinforced carbon composite core. The mechanisms were serviceable with the tool itself, which essentially made it possible to field strip the universal and reassemble it without any other instruments or spare parts. The point of any tool used in combat was that it must be repairable. After all, it was the enemy's mission to break things. If they couldn't be put back together, they weren't terribly useful on a battlefield. Must have cost you quite a sum. Rack said as he folded the combination set back up and replaced it in its case. Cost the government quite a sum. I got mine for free. Some friends of mine insist I carry it around just in case. I get a chance to use it here and there and about seven out of ten times I get it right on the first try. The albatross was in pretty good shape. Just needed a little frequency adjustment. Hunter winked at Nick who smiled. You, uh, some kind of official or something? We don't get core worlders all the way out here too often. Except when their water machines break down and they're looking for parts. Or the raiders light the linen storage on fire, one of the boys announced. Pamela tapped on the table to remind the boys not to interrupt when the adults were speaking. One frown was all it took to get them refocused on finishing their plates. I'm a Skywatch officer. Captain Jason Hunter, at your service. A Marine. Honored to have you at our table, Captain. My brother served in 3rd Marines, 7th from 37 to a 41. I'm afraid I'm just a fleet captain. I've got a regiment of marines on my ship, though. Toughest men and women alive. Went to the academy with their CO. While Rack struggled with what he had just been told, every other person at the table regarded Jason with new appreciation, Dawn in particular. Hunter realized he was turning into the proverbial silver-armored knight in the girl's eyes. He was fairly certain he would be the topic of conversation later when the girl gathered with her friends over voice channels or at some neighborhood occasion. It had been noted on many occasions there were some things that came with the uniform. Master Chief Buckmaster had always maintained that ladies were more attracted to military bearing than crisp seams. Hunter smiled when he remembered Moo's jabs about how fleet officers and cheerleaders wore uniforms for the same reasons. When challenged about his own officer's uniform, the Marine would always reply that dog faces didn't gear up looking for dates. They wore uniforms to blend in and avoid getting shot. Hunter realized there was little he could do about attention from the girl. One of the boys got into a snapping and slapping match with her, which put a temporary end to the sighing and staring, at least for a while. Rack looked as if he had just been awarded the peace prize. A fleet? Captain? No offense, son, but you look just about old enough to be a new father. How long have you served? 
Headed into my sixth year, Pamela poured more coffee. I was a jack driver for my first three years out of the academy. Fighter pilot too? That's amazing. Must have seen some action in the Praetorians. I did indeed. That was a hard run. Lost a lot of good men and women out there. The boys' faces were wide-eyed and frozen. By now, Jason Hunter may as well have been ten feet tall and carrying a handful of lightning bolts to breakfast. There was something brewing in the old man's eyes that drew a glare from Pamela. The boys were oblivious, naturally, as they were occupied with getting back outdoors and getting their recently restored aircraft back into the sky. If the old man had something to say before, he was positively shaking with the need to speak up again. Rack finally noticed and gave Pamela an exasperated look. I'm not going to get him involved, if that's what all that nodding and gesturing is about. Dawn rolled her eyes. Hunter sipped his coffee and tried to keep track of who was signaling whom. Involved in what? Normally, back-channel discussion of an unannounced problem wouldn't be a signal to Jason to get involved. Further, he wouldn't just come out and volunteer. There were a wide variety of reasons, not the least of which was the fact he was a high-ranking Skywatch fleet officer. There were regulatory and political ramifications to just about everything he did, on or off duty. There's a raiding party comes through here every so often. Pamela herded the boys into the parlor and sent them outside to play. This subject was apparently off-limits for the school-age crowd. Dawn wandered off, apparently having heard the story several times before. Rack hesitated for a few moments. He didn't appear to want any of the kids to hear. Jason listened intently. Had a big reptilian with them. Friend of mine at the machine shop in the village says their ship registers as a freighter when it pings our orbital monitor. But when they land, they've got a couple of nasty flyers they can shoot things all to hell with. They fly faster than anything we ever seen. Got from the village to the northern exchange in a couple minutes once. Folks have been buffaloed out of their equipment, money. Anything they can carry off they'll take, and they aren't satisfied with just one visit. Even threatened to poison our water once. Jason recognized the description of the alien. Sarn were popular with raiders because of their size and their ability to intimidate humans and other races of similar builds. They were frequently recruited as enforcers. Given the tension between the Empire and the Alliance, Sarn presence gave accomplices a menacing reputation. Hunter zeroed in on the description of the flight time from place to place. He felt the flicker of danger. He briefly thought of Cerulea and the fact she had brought him to EG-3 aboard the Shrike. It occurred to the captain the Queen of the Condor Pirates and her M-Gun would give these planet raiders a whole new appreciation for the concept of shooting things all to hell. For now, he stuck with the obvious. How far is it from the village to the northern exchange? Rack looked delighted, as if someone were finally listening to him after being ignored for a long time. I reckon it's got to be 300 miles or more. I know those rickety old ancient air cab frames can't do more than 200 miles per hour in clear skies. That day? The day they shot up our power grid? They made it from the wheat silo outside the village limits to the solar array south of the exchange in less than 15 minutes. Jason evaluated the man's story. Drawing on his knowledge of the preferences of criminal organizations, he recognized the air cav reference at once. Air cavalry had been a staple of Skywatch ground operations for several generations. Serving alongside orbital insertion units, the Air Cavalry was an artifact of a time when Skywatch operated both a Marine Corps and a regular ground army. Over the years, the surface warfare doctrines of the Army Division were subsumed into the more numerous Marine ranks, and the Army was eventually absorbed completely. Up to that point, the one thing the Corps Alliance Army had perfected was the use of atmospheric aircraft to supplement battlefield mobility in combat. The Air Cav craft design had undergone centuries of improvement since its debut in Old Earth's mid-20th century. As strange as it seemed, the justification for the gunship concept had its genesis in the highly focused attempts to produce the aerial equivalent of a standard armed troop transport. By the time the program was abandoned about 60 years before Jason's commission, the design had reached what many considered its apex. Air transports were relatively fast and maneuverable for VTOL atmospheric aircraft, considering their unusually high weight. They were moderately well-armed and extremely well-defended, which was the reason Jason assumed they were so popular with colony raiders. Without specialized weapons, it was extraordinarily difficult to damage or disable one of the old steel can configuration transports. They were essentially blocks of ablative composite and capsule-reinforced steel. 
Their entire purpose was to protect embarked infantry, so without ground-to-air missiles or armor-piercing ordnance, they were essentially indestructible. All that said, however, there was no chance one of those metal fat bodies, as Yili called them, could cover 300 miles in 15 minutes unless it was shot out of a cannon. Jason knew the answer to his next question, and that was the reason he wasn't going to ask it. He knew how a flying troop transport could do the equivalent of Mach 1.5. The problem was where they got the technology. The colonists on Epsilon Gamma 3 were facing the exact same problems Jace had encountered at Station 19 and the exact same problems Yi Li, Rebecca, and Zoni had overcome at Bione 3. Ships appearing and disappearing meant only one thing, and it didn't take a Skywatch captain to figure out the connection. It was likely the Planet Raider's Sarn associate was their source, and if that was true, Hunter's suspicions the mystery man who had fled to Raleo was working closely with the Sarn Star Empire intensified by a couple orders of magnitude. Why one Sarn operative would make use of this technology all the way out here was a mystery, however. There simply wasn't anything on Epsilon Gamma 3 worth someone's A-game, aside from a few thousand colonists and an unbelievable number of planet acres. If there was something on Epsilon Gamma 3 worth having, Jason had to find out what it was, and he had to do it before his enemies found it. More investigation was needed. Not sure why I'm telling you all this, but folks been hearing all kind of strange rumors. The kind of talk we never heard before. Explain. Rack glanced at Pamela, who by now had apparently resigned herself to the idea nothing was off limits, even though they had a guest for breakfast. Hunter was reminded of his own mother, and how mightily she fought for sanity and stability in a family full of military officers. Ask any of the clan who among them was the most important, and from father to youngest, they would all agree it was Mrs. Hunter. Her battles and her occasional super vetoes of whatever the rest of the family was up to were likely the only thing that kept everyone alive. Only orders could supersede an Eleanor Hunter super veto, and even then, Mom would insist on seeing those orders first. Mrs. Hansen got up and went to the kitchen. She was doing the same thing, but in this case it was pretty clear her solution was to avoid the subject altogether. As expedient as that might be, it was the reason moms weren't always the best leaders in a crisis. Hunter, like all military officers, understood well the concept of ignored problems showing up with more ammo, more manpower, and an even more savage determination later. There's talk of voices where there are no people. Strange lights at night. Not flying around but on the ground, out in the woods where nobody goes. Stanfield ran into a crater in his soybean plants, nearly forty yard across, but perfectly smooth, like someone had let a huge ball settle into the ground. All the dirt was gone, and the plants too. There wasn't so much as a tool mark anywhere near it. Based on what Hunter and his crew had gathered so far from their research, it not only sounded like someone was making use of the same displacement mechanisms they had encountered at Bioni, but it was pretty clear they were experimenting where nobody would notice. Any talk of weird phenomena out in farmer country would be dismissed as crazy old men seeing things after too many hits of the good stuff. But that only answered half the question. The other half was why Epsilon Gamma? There just wasn't anything here worth pursuing. Then again, there wasn't anything worth pursuing on Bione 3 either, at least initially. While it was true Atwell's little chamber of horrors was eventually turned up under the Lethe deep space, the only remarkable feature on the planet prior to that discovery was farmers tending an unbelievable number of planted acres. Nevertheless, Hunter suspected there was some kind of connection. Based on Commander Islington's encounter with the Invector Squadron, it was clear the Sarn had an increased level of interest in Bione generally. The strange goings-on on Hallow's Moon played some kind of role. The permanent teleportation device discovered on Bione 3, capable of moving personnel and equipment from planet to moon and back, could have been one phase of a long-term plan. It was possible Atwell had once enlisted the aid of the Star Empire and bribed his interlocutors with Ithis technology. Perhaps he had lost control of his contact and realized his co-conspirators had become his adversaries. Or perhaps they had been his adversaries all along. At that point the Sarn would have made use of what they had found regardless of what their supplier thought. To be fair, a star-faring civilization with billions of citizens on dozens or hundreds of planets had little to fear from a rogue human operative. The only missing piece of the puzzle was why the Sarn were focusing on remote colonies with farming operations. There was the issue of avoiding official notice, which was par for any course involving planet raiding. But there was more to it this time. Hunter didn't believe in coincidence. The Skywatch experience with bandit parties and commerce pirates 
was rarely as consistent as what had been described so far. These guys had a sophisticated operation going on that was much deeper than simply landing, gathering up a pile of loot and taking off. Planet raiders didn't fly 300 miles across a land surface unless they were leading an occupying army, and at that point, they weren't planet raiders anymore. Hunter obviously couldn't bring these facts into the discussion, at least not yet. So he punted.